Does that kind of make sense? So our basic structure is going to be, say, find the views that you want to you want to do something with, and then we can perform actions with them, and we can also say, does that view have these particular properties, right? Um, so putting those th three things together is usually mo all we need for most tests. Um, and the good news with this, you, you kind of saw him mention that, hey, we don't have to do any sleeps, right? With most testing frameworks, a lot of times we may have to say, we'll click on this button and sleep and wait till the other dialog pops up and the next screen shows up. So that becomes very handy and, and means that our tests are not as fragile. Um, because a lot of other UI testing frameworks, that's, that's a problem. It's like, well, okay, I ran it on this device and it took three seconds, and on this device it took one second, so now to make it work reliably, I have to make it take three seconds on every device, right? So it's clever in how it kind of figures that out when it can do the next thing. Um, so what we want to talk about today is kind of an overview of UI testing, how to set up your test environment with Espresso to make that work. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the new things that you need to do to make it work with Android X um, because they've changed where things are at again. Um, so we'll go through that. We'll also talk about how to create the tests and um, give some kind of examples as well as how to use the record feature. So as an overview, um, we want to say, kind of put this in the full screen. Um, there it goes. So the the upside of this is we kind of talk about. I mentioned unit testing at the beginning, right? Unit testing tests your your logic in the background, um, but a lot of times, really, what the user cares about is just the basic can I use the test, right? So creating a, can I use the app? So creating a few just quick, what we might call smoke tests or, or basic tests of the, the core functionality of your app um, with this can be very helpful, right? You don't want to release an app and then find out that nobody can log in, right? Or you don't really want to release an app and then say, well, nobody can read an article. Right, so we can write a few quick tests just to make sure that those things are good before we push the software out. Right, so that's it's 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 very very much important to have a few of these at least. Okay, um, so we can also in this process try invalid values and see well what happens if I put something in there that's invalid? Do I get the correct error message, correct response, or does the application crash? Right. Um, that helps. Um, I can also say, okay, well, let's look at the output and make sure that it's actually correct. It's what I expect it to be. Or is it presented the correct way? Um, downside with manual testing, which we've kind of talked about before, is, is in general doing manual testing is it's fairly time consuming and, and especially tedious when you start to deal with different device configuration, different densities, and different languages, right? So say you're supporting five different devices with 10 different languages, well now you have 50 different configurations to test. That's not terribly feasible for a human. Um, but it is actually really easily doable with some automated testing, okay? And, and at that point, it's quicker to write the automated test than go test it 50 times. Right. It may not seem like much of an upside if you're saying you only have one device from targeting in one language, right? Because that ought, that testing does not take nearly as long. But as your application grows, that becomes more and more of a benefit. Um, one thing you need to be, uh, oh, you know, the other thing that happens there, typically when we write manual tests, when we write them out, um, we have to kind of record them and then later run them. You know, we have to record what we're going to do and then be able to run them frequently as changes are made to that code. Well, it may be that the UI changes, right? It may be that the button that was here moves to, say, over there, right? So that's one of the things anytime that happens, well, now we have to go update all those test cases, 
right? So that happens with manual testing. It happens a little bit with the automated testing, but typically the automated tests are a little bit easier to update um, if an option moves from one place or another. And also given that it's kind of tied with the code, um, usually we find if a change like that happens, we can make it such that the, that the test doesn't even compile. So if I say I move this option from being um, this place to that place, if I change the ID, well then that test no longer compiles and I know I need to go fix it. Um, so there's a lot of benefits there and it can, it can, we can, if we play our cards right, we can even make it automatically basically flag which ones would be broken by our changes. Other, rather than having manual paper tests and we say, well, I don't know which ones are broken until I run them. And then I have to ask her saying, okay, the test failed. Was that because of the cha intentional change we made or is that because of, you know, is that because there's a bug? Um, and there's also the question of how do you sequence those tests? You know, I have to do these steps somehow in order, right? And, and how are those orders kind of dependent? Um, if I'm doing manual testing, oftentimes it doesn't make sense to do a small sense, small test, reset everything, and then do a small test and reset everything. But if we're doing automated tests, we can easily reset between each test, which means we're going back to a predictable state and we know where we're starting. So the upside of doing all this automatically, first of all, it can really free up our time and resources to do other things that are perhaps more productive um, rather than spending hours and hours and hours and months on end testing our software before we can release it or testing it to make sure that there's just finding those bugs um, we can spend our time doing other things like making our tests better making our automated tests better um, we can also because they're faster we can get input we can get feedback on that quicker. So you can hook up any of these automated tests, whether it's a unit test or espresso test, you can hook them up in a way that every time you push to GitHub, every time you push to your Git repo, it will run all these. So any developer on your team runs that, done. All the tests, you can see which ones are currently failing and without really requiring any additional interaction by the user. You can just say, okay, well, here's our report. 90% of our, t our tests are passing. These 10% are, are failing. That's where we need it. We know we have a bug and we need to go fix. So you can find out about it really quickly because they're written in code. There's no, there's typically not nearly as many problems with, hey, I run it today and I skipped a step and then tomorrow I ran it and I maybe did something else, right? Because that's one of the things that happens when you put real world users against paper is sometimes they forget to do something or sometimes they do it twice sometimes they do things out of order and then maybe you get into situations where like okay that should have passed but i don't really know what they did right um so repeatability reproducibility is a big deal with those automated tests because i can always just rerun the test and see what happened Um, and then again, I can run those for all kinds of states, configurations, languages, etc. cetera. Okay. So Espresso is really well designed for working with testing a single app. Okay. As long as I have just a single app that I'm working with, uh, Espresso works really well in that case. Um, so I can verify that the UI works as I, the way I want to. Um, I can make sure the outputs are correct. Um, I can make sure that navigation is the way I want it to be. Say I click on this button, it takes me to that screen, that screen. I can follow all those navigation links and make sure A, they work and that they take me to the right place um, and that the correct data is loaded. Um, so that works really well. Um, typically when we use these espresso tests, we also want to mock out our dependencies. So any connections that we have to say a database or web services or Bluetooth devices or whatever it may be, we typically want to stub those out so that they're not 
um, involved. Um, that's just to make our, that's A, to make our tests quicker, as well as to just reduce the scope of where the problems might be. Now that, that does depend on your test. You may, you may want to have some tests where you, you stub that out, and you may want to have some other tests where you have that database in there to see if those things work. And, and you can really do both. Um, there's another tool um, called UI Automator, and um, we won't really be doing much of anything with it in this class, um, but it does work better um, when you're dealing with multiple apps, um, or say you're built in, working with some apps that are already built into the Android OS. Um, so it's a little bit better for driving your tests in that case. That makes sense? The design for that a little bit better. Um, both of these two frameworks, whether it be Espresso or UI Automator, require something called instrumentation. Instrumentation is part of the Android OS and gives us a way to hook in and find out um, when certain things happen or get access to what controls are on screen or what state those controls are, etc., etc. Um, normally, all your apps on your phone or tablet or whatever are boxed, so they, different apps can't talk to each other. Right? I can't go look and see what password you entered in your other in Facebook if I'm writing my own little game. You know, I can't I can't see the data that another app is seeing. Or I can't interact with the controls in that other app because there would be a lot of ways to exploit that. You know. Um, so typically that's not allowed, but instrumentation allows us to do that. Um, but it only allows us to do that for apps that we are writing ourselves. Um, so it allows to access those components, it allows us to control them, click on buttons, do all those things. Um, so that's, that's a core part um, of this. Okay. Um, upsides, all, another upside of instrumentation, we can monitor anything that's happening with the Android system. In fact, we can even look potentially at some of the other things that are going on with the system outside of our app. Um, that's to a limited extent, um, but we basically know what programs are running and what are not, and how much memory they're taking up for things like that. Things like that we can look at. Um, we can also, because we're kind of directly injected, we can actually interface with the classes that we've written, um, which means that we can call methods on those objects. Um, so let's say I have a method called do thing. Well, I can call do thing from my test because I may need to. I, I can invoke those methods. Um, I can also look at fields and modify them if I would so need, um, get into all of the, the different objects and, and get access to them. And because we're kind of running effectively, sort of when we run these automated tests with instrumentation, it's like they're running in the same app. They're running together. Um, so I can get access to all that. Um, so that, that can be helpful too if I want to look at things more than just what's on the UI. Maybe I want to look at some of those state variables that are behind the scene. I can do that too. So to get the environment set up, um, if you start a new Android project, most of this will already be done. Okay? And if you start a new Android project, most of these pieces that we're going to talk about here will have already been put in place. Um, However, if you're starting with one of their template projects, you may need to do some of these pieces yourself, or if you've accidentally removed a few things, you may need to do this as well. Okay. So first thing we need in here, test implementation, being it, that's just the, hey, what's, what, that's brought in for the, um, both the local tests as well as the instrument, instrument tests. So that's actually needed. For both. Okay. Beneath that, we have the Android test implementation. This is all of our Gradle dependencies. Um, these three are only used when we're running instrumenting tests. So they don't, this stuff doesn't apply if I'm running local tests or if I'm just running the code, if I'm regularly running the app. Does that make sense? Remember, if I use implementation, those things are always included in the app. So these are only included if I'm running tests. Um, so the first one I have here is Android X test EXE. That's our basic kind of core part 
uh, a lot of units have been cleaned. And we also have a structure for, so those are the key ones historically. We needed to run with an Ingram X because it gives an older civil repair for running it with the support library, uh, which you'll see there in the Sparta project. Um, this other one, this third one, you may need, you will definitely need to add manually um, because it doesn't get added automatically. Okay? Um, what's happened recently in the most recent version of Espresso, they took that rule annotation, or sorry, the rule class, the activity rule class, which you saw in the video, which is what we used to start our activity. Um, that has been moved out of core and into Espresso instance for better or for worse, I think that was actually a mistake. Um, but in the recent version, we moved that from the list. So if you don't include a tense, you're going to get an error, and it'll say, hey, I can't find this class. I can't find the activity. Um, so you want to make sure you include that. Um, the other piece that we need to make sure that we have in the default config is this one line here. So test instrumentation level. That tells it which class to use anytime you run an instrumental test. Okay, so if I look at the Gradle config, I'll open up a project I have ready here, and we can kind of see where some of those are. So let me open up phone number spinner. So I'm going to look at my Gradle file. So there we've got the line. It's here in the default config. So that's the line that tells it what test runner use for instrument tests. Again, that should be already there. Um, but if you're switching from support to Android X, you may have to change that line. Um, also in here, reminder, if you're using Android X, um, you'll need to have your target version here, and target version and compile SDK. Both of these will be need to set. You'll need to set both of those to 28 or higher. So, so set them to 29, and then you'll be able to use all the Android X stuff. Um, so we need to add them to the test runner, and then we've got our dependencies down here. So that's the part that matter. Now, if I was running, let me open up this project before I converted it to Android X, so I can kind of walk through how to make that change. Um, did you do, there's the starter projects. So, phone number spinner. So here I'm starting with an older template, um, the original starter project here. And you can see that all of these dependencies are on the support library, right? So I want to update these to Android X. Um, so there's actually a quick way to do that. Um, if you right click in the Gradle file, you're going to go to refactor, refactor, migrate Android X. And that will actually do most of the work for you to just change the entire project over to Android X. Um, rather than having to go manually change your Gradle file and all your XML files and all your, um, all your Java files over, you can just go click on that. So I'm going to say migrate to Android X. Oh. Now, it is going to tell me here that it has to have a compile SDK of at least 28, right? So before I actually do that, this is targeting 26. I need to move this up to 29. So I'm going to move that up to 29. 
you can still you can see it's still got the old support test runner there okay so I'm gonna right click here again I'm gonna say refactor and migrate to Android X oh and I also need to update my Gradle build okay so let's go do that too um, so if I go to module settings project you can see this one started out as 301 so I need to move it up to the latest stable one which at the moment is here 353 okay so I'm going to go up to 353 let it sync so once I've updated the Gradle and the target SDK version um, that should allow me to now migrate it to Android X. Okay. Fix Gradle wrapper and reinform project. Okay. So you update that too. Okay. So that's up to date. Refactor. Migrate to Android X. Um, you do have an option to back up the project to a zip file. Um, I would recommend actually making sure you commit the project before doing this. Is it honestly the safer way to do it? Um, so I'm actually going to uncheck that. Okay. So I'm going to hit do refactor. It's given me all the changes that need to be made. I can see the, the imports and such, all the files that it's going to change. I'm going to go ahead and say do refactor. Yep. Yep. So we'll change everything. Um, so now that I've converted it, you can see I've got the Android X dependencies here. I've got the material that's switched over. Um, I've got all of these pointing at Android X, and it's also switched the, the test runner over to the new Android X test runner. Um, so that's the way you can do that conversion. Um, I've already uploaded, if you look under Lesson 6, uh, um, some projects that are already up to date um, with that. So you can start from there for 6.1. Um, but that's that's how I did that. Okay. Now, one thing, there are a few things that that doesn't do. Um, so specifically, if I go into my Android test here, Um, you'll actually see that there's an error. Okay, so on this line, instrumentation registry dot get target context, um, because that method has actually been effectively removed. So get target context is somewhere else now. Um, in order to get the target context, you have to say instrumentation registry dot get instrumentation dot get target context. So that's the part you want to add if you're migrating to a newer version. You'll need to add that get instrumentation, otherwise it won't compile. All good? Um, so now we have we have that project migrated. So that so that's that's the part you want to do. Um, you'll also notice in here that these are still yellow. See, so when I did the migration, it didn't get the latest version of these dependencies. It got the, the original version. Um, so in order to get the latest version, I need to go Alt-Enter on there. I'm going to say change to 1.1. It's going to change it. Go ahead and change it to the newest one. So those are all up to date. And now I can hit Save now. Now, you'll notice in there, remember there's one dependency that I said you'll need to add. What dependency was that? That third dependency that you'll need to add. Intense, Espresso, Intense. So it added Espresso Core, um, but it hasn't added Espresso Intense. So I will need to actually add that in here manually.
Um, so it comes in like that. It's the same version number as what the core is. Is those are kind of tied version numbers at the moment. So that's how we set up the project. Okay. But as I mentioned previously, all or most of that will be done in the template. Um, but if you but in the template it doesn't include this express code. So you'll still need to have that if you want to create one in your template. Okay. Um, one thing, a few things that we need to do if we're trying to do this automated testing on a physical device, um, we may want to do this as well with an emulator. Uh, we need to turn on US debugging. We've already taken care of that. Um, but then under developer options, um, we need to turn off managers. Um, that's kind of a, the, the recommendation that could work better. Um, is to go say, take all these, the window animation scale, the transition scale, the duration scale, we're going to turn all of those settings off. Um, so you can do that in the emulator. Um, you can also do that on a physical. Um, so if I pull up my emulator, um, I've already made that change, but I can show you where that setting is. Um, and you probably want to do that at this point. So I'm going to open up my, I'm going to run this on my Nexus S. Um, you don't, it depends on what you're doing the testing on, right? So I'd say that probably you'll want to do this this espresso test on emulators primarily um, more than your physical device. Um, you can do it on either, um, but I think that more than likely this will work better on the emulators. Um, so if I go back, let's go to the home screen. I'm going to go into my settings app. Um, now the first thing I need to do, because USB debugging and the developer options are not enabled by default, is I actually need to go turn that down on. So I'm going to go up down to, where is it? Um, nope, that's not the one I want. Remind me, remind me how, I, how did I get there yesterday? System. Well, developer options is now is here, um, but I had to turn on developer options. And I'm trying to remember where where I had to go to do that because I had to go find the build number. There it is. Okay. So in order to do this on the emulator, first thing you'll want to do is go into system. And then about emulated device, and then down at the bottom you'll hit the build number, and you'll tap that until it tells you that you're a developer. Okay, because we need to turn on the developer options. This is not in the regular user settings; it's in the developer options. So once you become a developer, then you can go back to developer options and find the settings. So you'll have to scroll down pretty far um, to find these. Um, on your physical device they'll probably be under the drawing section um, but that was not where I found them on my emulator. There they are. Actually no there it is in the drawing section. Okay so here are the three settings. So you've got window animation scale, um, transition animation scale and animation duration scale. Um, you're going to click on those and change all of those off. By default they will be set to one times. So you want to change each of these three to off. Please do that now. Thank you. 
that's saying it did seem that the, the automated test largely did work, even with the animation on, um, but they just don't generally recommend the way the rules for the test rules. Yeah, um, shut down the other signal. So when I and then you want to go into capturing the third one, so you want to send it off this. Okay. You have that as well. You find the guard. Now that will obviously turn off all the animations in your device. So if you do need to do stuff with animations and test those or transitions, you want to go back in and turn those on. Um, which is the other reason why I say you probably want to do this in an emulator, because that way you can just leave that emulator with the, the transition turns off, whereas you probably want to test your transitions on a physical device. Okay, so that's set up. Um, as far as where the tests are stored, um, this folder will already be there. Um, remember, our regular code is stored in the name of our app, slash source, slash name. So our, our tests, regular tests, are stored in module name, source, and our tests. So if we're looking for them in a disk, that's where we'll find them. Um, if we're looking at them in Android Studio, um, they look like they're just right next to our regular code. Um, so if I look over here, you'll see that I've got this source set, which is my regular code. I've got another source set, which is my Android test. And you may have that other third source set called test, um, which is going to be your local local tests, your local unit tests, which we talked about previously. So does that make sense? So all of our tests need to be in this Android test folder. Otherwise, they won't work. Okay. Um, those tests are based on JUnit, um, our regular a regular unit tests run with JUnit, but remember they run on your desktop, so they're really using regular um, Java SE to run them, versus these instrumented tests are going to be running 
on your device. That's the difference, right? Rather than running on your laptop or desktop, these are running on your actual device or your emulator. Um, but they both use JUnit. So to create a test, um, we'll create a new class. I'm just going to start in that folder, create a new class. Um, typically, we're going to end the name of that class with test. So this is change text and data test. Um, on top of that class, we need to add two annotations. So the first one is the run with, run with Android JUnit 4.class. Um, and the second annotation we need to do is what is the size of the test? Um, so it can be one of three things. It can be a small test, it can be a medium test, or it can be a large test. Okay. So a small test is typically something that doesn't talk to network resources or web services or databases or files. It's something that can run very quickly. Their kind of recommendation for a small test is it should run under a minute. Okay. But the, the general requirement is that it's something that doesn't talk to external resources or apps or requirements. Um, for our medium tests, um, they might be able to talk to the local network, but we don't want them to go out to the internet and make communication there. Does that make sense? So they might talk to a server that's on your local, your company's network. Um, maybe talk to a database that you have in house, or a server or a website that you have in house. We wouldn't want them to go talk to, say, Google or Facebook um, in a medium test. And then a large test, you can do the same. Does that make sense? So we're kind of grouping it by how much external resources we're using. And the reason we do that is then the test runner can kind of group these together and say, well, I'll, I'll run all the small tests and then the medium tests and then the large tests so you can get a quicker read on, on where your application is and such, um, as well as just interdependencies between those tests. So let's go through real quick um, creating a new test class because there is one, at least one thing I want to show you with that. Um, so I'm going to right click on the Android test folder here. I'm going to say new Java class and say I'm just going to call this hello world test. So, from the slide, what's the first annotation do I need to add to this? That I need to add to this class to make it an actual test class. Run with. Run with. Okay. So you say at run with. Okay. Is that it? Is there anything else I need to add? The huh? The runner. The runner. Right. So which class do I need to put in there? So just JUnit? So Android JUnit. Okay. JUnit 4. Okay. Now, one of the things that I need you to notice here, okay, you notice that there's actually two options that are coming up. Okay, there's Android JUnit. They're both called Android J Unit. So what's different? Well, they're in a different namespace. Okay? And notice that one of them's got a strike through. What does that mean? Deprecated, right? So there is actually an Android. There are three classes called Android J Unit run uh, J Unit 4. There are four classes with that, uh, sorry, three classes with that same name. So the first one is the support library version. Um, you're not seeing that version because we didn't include that in our Gradle dependency, right? So it doesn't know about that class. Um, but we are seeing both of these that are still part of Android X. Okay, you see that? Both of those are part of Android X. Um, so what's happened is, first of all, when Jetpack came out, 
Android says, well, Android said, well, first we'll, Google said, we'll, we'll copy the class from the support library and we'll just put it in Android X. Exactly the same way. No changes, right? So that's the first version that you're seeing here at the bottom that's deprecated. Is literally just the same thing that was in the support library. Um, what they've then done is said, well, we need to actually make some changes to um, this test run to make things better. Um, so now that old version is deprecated, we need to use the new version. Okay, so that's why you're seeing two new two versions there. You want to make sure you use the one from androidx.test.ext.junit runners. That's the new one. So when I click here, I want to make sure I click on that one. And that'll import the correct thing. So that's the thing to watch. If you create a test, you may find, if you create this test, you may find that you accidentally picked the wrong one, and that's deprecated. That's what's up, is there's two classes with the same name. I'm going to call this a small test. So I'm going to say at small test as well. So I have the basic structure of my test class put in place. Okay. The next thing I need to add in is this activity test rule, which remember, so this is what this is going to do is cause the activity to be started every time, or, or created, started, resumed, all of that, when I start the test, and then destroyed after I finish the test. So we'll always start a test with a brand new recipe. Uh, if I need a service, which we'll talk about in Unit 3, I would use the service test rule to start and destroy those services in some sort of fashion. Now, let me go ahead and add this in, because there is one thing I want to, another similar thing that I want to call to your attention. Um, so there's two classes there, um, and this is actually, let me go Alt-Enter, Alt-Enter, okay. So I have a rule here, that's my activity rule. Um, I went ahead and added the dependencies up here. We can see here's the rule annotation, and here is the Android X test rule, activity test rule, okay? So this class we need, right? Now let me go back to the Gradle and show you what happens if we don't have that intense dependency, right? So if I don't have this intense dependency, which is where you're going to be probably initially, you see it can't find the activity test rule. Okay, so that's that's the part that's changed with the recent version of Espresso. Um, it used to be that these are the only dependencies that you needed, um, but that particular class, the activity test rule, has now been moved into Espresso accounts. Okay. So if you're trying to write this code and you're getting that error, you're saying, I can't find the activity test rule, um, that's because you need this additional dependency now. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. So that's that's why we had to add that. Okay. Um, going back here. So I've added my activity test rule. Now I can finally start adding the code for my test. Um, so in some cases, you may need, just like we had our with our JUnit test, we had a before method and we had an after method. Remember, your before method is always run before your test. Your after method is always run after your test. So these are setup and teardown stuff. Anything that's required to get ready for the test and anything that's required to clean up after the tests so are ready for the next test. Those are we're going to put in. Those we're going to put in the before and after methods. Now, typically, um, most of your espresso tests will not need a before and after um, 
clause because your activity test rule your, will take care of that teardown and creation. Um, usually that's all you need. Okay? But you can have them in there if you need if you need them, just like you can with a regular JUnit test. Okay. So now what we want to do is actually make the test method. Okay. So if I add this. Okay. So here's where we're going. I need to import that. So I'll enter. Okay. So create a method, public void, no parameters, and some test allocation. Um, so that's what I need in order to declare a new test list. Um, I can have as many test cases as I want. What I call them is completely up to you. You can give this method any name. Um, but it needs to have that test allocation or your test runner won't actually pick it up for you. Um, so there's three steps in here. First, we need to find a view, we need to perform an action, we need to check the result. Okay, so that's a basic series of steps for creating any test. We need those three parts. Okay. So let's talk about how to do each of those things. Um, so first of all, we're going to be using Camcrest, um, which you may have already gotten introduced to with the JUnit stuff. Um, remember, Hamcrest is just kind of an anagram for matchers. That's where that name comes from. Um, but it gives us a way to create a lot of matchers and assertions by kind of putting things together. Um, a lot of, historically, a lot of unit testing frameworks, well, what we've ended up with is the ex explosion of assertion statements and whatnot where it's like, okay, I want to do this, and so there's there's 20 overloads or 20 different methods to do assertions. Um, so Hamcrest actually reduces the number of methods that we have to know or have to be in the framework um, because it allows us to kind of nest things and put things together and reuse a lot of these quote-unquote matchers. Um, it also means that our output, um, when we have errors um, as far as what went wrong, these Hamcrest matchers also make it easier to read the error message um, because they'll give you a more descriptive error message than what you would have otherwise. Okay. Um, so as far as the different kind of matchers that we have here, um, we have view matchers, um, which say, okay, I want a view that matches these criteria. These criteria. I can also have assertions which say, okay, I want this to be true. Um, if it's not true, then it's an exception, then it's an error. Um, and I also want to perform these actions. So I want to say I want to perform a click or a long press or a double click or type this these letters into this text box. I can do all those things with the view actions. Okay. So a basic example of maybe how to write a test. Bring this up. So we've got the first step, which is to find the control. So I'm going to use on view. Anytime you want to get access to the control, you're going to start with on view. So I'm going to say find a view with this ID. Right? And notice I'm actually using the resources that I defined in my project. I don't have to redefine those IDs. I can just reuse them. So and that's the benefit of being kind of hooked up, have them kind of built into the same project. So I can say on view with ID, edit text user input. So this is going to find the control with that ID. Okay. And then I can work with it. Okay, so I'm going to say perform, and I'm going to actually give it a series of actions to perform. So the first thing I'm going to tell it to do is to type in some text. Right? I defined that constant previously here, so I'm telling it espresso. I could have that be anything. So I'm going to tell it to type espresso into that text box, and then I'm going to tell it to close the soft keyboard. Okay? So just like a user might work with your system. 
type in some text, close the keyboard, and then what is the next thing I need to do? Okay, so I've performed that action. I want to see what the output is. Um, well, one step before that, I need to click button. So I'm going to type some text, close the keyboard, and then I'm going to say find another view that has the ID change text button, and click on that button. Type some text, close the keyboard, click on that. And then finally, we want to check the output. So again, I'm going to find a control, right? So three different controls I'm working with. I've got an edit text, I've got a button, and then I've got some sort of text view where I'm going to see the output. So that text view, I'm saying, okay, the idea of that is text to be changed. And I want to see, say, check, does it match? This text. Does it have this text? So I'm going to say M string to do that. So this would pass if that label now, that text view now, has the same text as I typed in. That makes sense? Otherwise it would fail. Now, I do want to go through real quick and see how do we do that in Android Studio. Um, I need to actually open up a different project. Um, so I'm going to go over to the two activities project, which you should already have because it was a previous lab assignment. There we go. Okay, so I'm in two activities. So you remember with this app, it's got two screens. The first screen, I can type in some text, hit send, and they'll appear on the second screen, and vice versa. I can type in some text here, and it will send it back to the previous screen. Right. So I want to do some basic testing with this, because um, it's got those, those controls that I needed. Um, it's got an edit text on that first page, and then a button. And then I'm going to look at the text view on the second page. Okay. So to create a test here, I'm going to say create new, just to get back up to where we were. Um, yeah, probably be worth it um, if you have your um, two activities open. Um, you can do this with either. You can start with your own. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to add those annotations. Inside here. Oh, before I get too far with that. Remember, I need to go to my Gradle and add, oh, I've already done that. So I've already added the intents. Dependency. Okay. So at rule, private activity test rule. So I'm going to start with the main activity. So that's the class that I'm going to put there. Uh, quick question. Yes. Do you just create a new Java class in that folder? Yeah, I just created a new folder, a new class here called Basic Test. Okay. New activity test rule. And then I need to give it the class. So this is going to be main activity dot class. 
So you can see main activity is appearing in both places. Um, obviously, if you wanted to test another screen that wasn't the main activity, wasn't the first screen, um, you could do that this way and actually jump into your app midway, not having to go through the entire workflow to get to a particular screen. You could just start on that screen. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to add a test case. Public void enter text. So first I need to enter some text into the text box on the first screen. So I'm going to say on view with ID r.id dot edit text main. Right. So you'll notice as I'm going along here, all this stuff is red. Right. All this stuff is red because it's not going to be there by default. Okay. Now, if I hit Alt Enter on that line, um, I'll get some choices here. So I'm going to say import static method on view, Alt Enter again to bring the other one in. And that's added these two lines here. Um, because most of these methods for Espresso and Hamcrest, um, they're all going to be static methods. Okay. So you can see that the on view is part of the Espresso class. You can see the with ID method is part of view matchers. Okay. And then finally, I want to say, let's type some text in there. So let's say perform. And I'm going to say um, type text. Yeah, and the text I want it to type is hello world. And then close the soft keyboard. Okay, I also need to add that type text in here. Okay, so that's my first line. What is it complaining about? Form cannot be applied. Might need to do No, but that's not what I need to do. I actually do these as two separate steps. So I need to do perform. So I don't know how they have that working on the example. Perform. Close off keyword. So that's what I should see. So I find the edit text, and then I say perform these two actions on there. Job method perform void. Why why is it not happy? Cannot resolve perform void. Do I need to have these as just two separate lines? Yeah. The way I just had it? Yeah. What did I um oh your import line is so do action dot Oh, that's what happened. There it goes. Okay. That's why. I'm like, this should work. Okay. Because apparently there's two closed soft keyword methods. Okay. Um, so type in some text, close the keyboard. And then I'm going to click the button. So on view 
with ID and R dot ID dot what? Well, let's look. If I look at the layout, I can find out what ID that needs to be. So if I look at main, I can see that the button here is called button main. So that's the one I'm going to use. So button, button main, and then we're going to perform a click on that. Dot perform. And then finally, if I've done those two things, so I've entered some text and I hit the button, right, I should see the text that I entered on the next screen, right? So I'm going to say on view with ID and then r.id and I need to find out what the ID is of that text on the second screen. So if I'm looking at the second screen, it's this one here. So it's text underscore message is that ID. So text message. So check, step one, matches. So once I get through, oh, there are view assertions. Um, so once I get to this point, what I put in check matches can be anything that matches a view. So it actually can be anything that I put into this, same thing I put into the on view method. Okay. So that can be, I can say, I compare the ID. I could compare and see what the text is the text this, or I could look at, say, um, is it displayed? Is it visible? Okay. Um, so in this case, I want to say, is it, first of all, I want to tell it, I want to say, is it displayed? So is displayed. Okay. But I probably also want to check that it is, um, that it has the text that I typed in. Okay. So I could do that as another statement here. I could say dot check matches with text. Um, hello world. So I could do that as a separate statement. Um, I can also combine any set of matchers um, with the method false all up. So I can either write that third statement that way, or I could write that third statement as follows. I could say all of And then that's org, uh, that's matchers. So I can either write it this way with two check statements, or I can write it all in one check using the, the all of method. the biggest problem mm -hmm. is going to be making sure we have the right imports. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so in this case, as, as far as, oh, yeah, I do need another parentheses. Um, or not. Check matches all of why is it think, does it think I need a fourth one? 
Oh, I do need it for fun. Um, yeah, so that's going to be one of those catches is to making is to make sure that you have all the right imports. Now, one thing you can do in this case, I know I said that you usually don't want to do this with regular code, but for um, these kind of automated tests, whether it be unit tests or espresso tests, um, it can be worth to implement import a bunch of these methods all at once. So rather than writing one for each method that I want to bring in, I could say, well, I want all the ones from view actions. I want all the ones from view assertions. And I want all the ones from view matchers. If you do that, you will probably have fewer issues getting the right ones. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, because more than likely, you'll be using quite a few from all three of those classes. And so you might as well just bring in all the methods and um, so again that's okay in this case I usually wouldn't do that um, but in this particular instance um, that actually makes your code cleaner I would say to bring in all of those methods okay um, so that's that so you either write it this way or you can use all of to group together a set of matchers to say it has to be this and that. Yep. Um, let's go ahead and let's do that. Um, come back at 210. Okay. So I'm going to comment these last two lines out. Because um, remember, that's just another way to do the third step. So I did run into one issue um, because at this point we probably want to run this text and make sure that it works. Um, so let's say we, in order to run this, you kind of run it like you did previously with your other unit test. We're going to right click on basic test and we're going to say run basic test. Okay. Yeah, I commented out the last check. Um, if I look at this, you see it, it ran the test, but it, it failed, right? And it says it fails with, it can't run the Android J unit class runner. Um, what happened is that I gave the wrong access modifier to my activity role. Um, so this, this is what happened. I, this needed to be public, not private. So if I change this to public and rerun it, that error will go away. Okay, so there it ran cleanly. And if I have my device kind of showing at the same time, um, this may be fast enough that it's hard to see, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and hit run, pay really close attention to the end of it. <coughs> So you can see it opens up. I can see it typing in the text. Done, right? So that's an awful lot quicker than a human actually sitting down and doing it, right? Um, and you can see, so, so that's very fast, a lot quicker than a person actually running the UI. Um, and you can also see at the end of the day, um, this is actually pretty readable. It's pretty easy to see what the intent was, you know? what's going on with it because it's all basically in English. Say hey, I want to type in some text, close the keyboard, click a button, and then check if this thing showed up and has the correct text. All good. So that's that's the process of setting up a basic test with Espresso. Okay. Um, to kind of break out some of the pieces that we saw here, Go back to full screen here. So you saw with tech, with ID, with ID gives me a matcher to say this view has the specific ID. With text gives me a matcher for saying, hey, this this text view, this button, this edit text, any of those have this text inside of it. I can use all of to combine any of these matchers together. You also saw I have the is displayed matcher to say is it visible or not. 
Um, yeah, so I can combine those. So say I want to find a view. It's got the negative word. It's got the text. It's put word 15, and it's displaying. I could combine all three of those texts. And that would give, that would give you the view that matches those three things, which might be helpful if, say, you're working with a recycler view. Right? You may want to check not just the ID because all of the items in the recycler view will have the same ID. You also want to check the text. Um, if you do need to reuse a view for multiple things, um, this doesn't happen very often. I would generally say use it with the syntax that we just did. Uh, but if you do need to save that view to a variable to reuse it, um, you can um, on view returns what's called a view interaction object. View interaction represents a basically a default. So that's what on view returns. So I can say, okay, let me get this this control matches all these conditions. Save it to a save it to a variable called text view, and then type it to the one of the things that that does let me do is give this a name um, because with all of these conditions, it can be kind of hard to tell what is the expectation for what control that is, um, especially if my ID doesn't necessarily make that clear. Um, so that can sometimes make things a little bit more readable, but I'd say most of the time you want to stick with the other way of writing. First, performing actions. We saw we can type text um, to put text in there, close soft keyboard, click. All of those go into the perform method to validate or do some assertions to make sure that I get the correct output. I'm going to use a check that matches and then any sort of match or okay. um, If the test does fail, um, so we can change the test a little bit and we'll see this. If I say change to match to, this is a failing test, so it's going to be not what's in the output, then I'll get a message here um, that will show me what went wrong and maybe where it went wrong. Okay. So let's look at that. I'm going to go back to my test here and I'm going to say um, be hello human and then run the test again so obviously it's going to say hello world at the end but I've said oh I expect hello human okay well if I look here I can see that it's failed I can what it gives me is the entire log cat for that run um, so I need to actually scroll down and find the actual error here we have it. So we see an enter text, we got an exception. And we can see it says do, 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 assertion failed with cause. It says, hey, I didn't find something, I didn't find a view that matched hello human. Okay. Um, this part, first part, can be a little bit cryptic. Um, so what you probably want to look at is the two lines that say expected and got. So the expected is we wanted a control with hello human. Um, but what we actually got was this control here. Um, and it actually gives me all of the current attributes or most of the current attributes of that control. Um, so if I scroll all the way over to the right. And here I can find the text. Um, there it is. So the text of it was hello world, even though it was expecting hello human. So I can kind of decipher the message from there and see what, what might have gone wrong. It's not as clear to read as I would hope, to be honest, um, but that's that's how you get in there and that's how you start reading that. Make sense? But that's what you're going to see when a test fails. Um, if you have more than one test, all of those should show up here. 
Um, by default, this box is not checked. Um, so with it not being checked, it's not going to show you any of the tests that passed. It's just going to hide those. But if you want to be able to see the tests that passed as well, you want to check that box. That way you can see all of them. Um, so we can write all of these all of these tests by hand, and I honestly would generally recommend doing that. Um, it obviously does require a little bit of knowledge of code to do that, so this is not necessarily something that you can hand off to um, a business analyst or your or or somebody that's not technical to write these tests. It really does have to still be a developer, um, but there is a tool for recording tests. Um, the way it works, you just kind of click around and use the app, and it will kind of write the code as you're doing it. Okay, um, so let's walk. Um, you can also put in assertions along the way, um, and you can do a lot of different interactions in one session. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna play around with this a little bit. I'm gonna start that by rec run record espresso test. I'm just gonna go back to Android Studio and see what we get. So run ex record expresso test. So you have two things open now. So you're going to have your actual app or your, your, your emulator or your device that you're running it on. And, and you're going to have this record test view open on the side. Okay. So as I do things in the emulator, same thing if I do this in a physical device, it's going to capture those over in this left window. Okay. So I'm going to start typing in. I'm going to say hello. And you'll notice that there's quite a bit of lag. Um, that unfortunately doesn't go away just by turning off animations. Um, but it's a little bit ex a little expensive to record these. Um, Hello. So there's some lag between me typing in the letters and when it actually shows up. And apparently I hit the cap lock, caps lock key. Okay. So I've got that. I'm going to dismiss the keyboard. Okay. You can see it's, I press the done key and I'm going to press send. So, so far it's captured all of the actions that I've given it, right? You can see that on the left. So type in some text, hit done, then press the send button. Okay. Now I may want to check that it's now doing what I expected. Um, so the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to click the add assertion button here. Okay. It's going to take a little bit of time to grab the state. Um, and now I can kind of hover over which control I want to check. Okay, so so which control do I probably want to put an assertion on? Right, so this one here. So I'm going to click on that. You can see it's highlighted here. It's going to say the text is hello world. So it's just kind of automatically assuming that right now the text is right. If it wasn't right, then I could change it to say that and have it be something else, right? So I can I can change that as I'm working through it. Um, but I'm going to just leave it here. Okay. Now I have two options. I can either say save this assertion. It's going to add it in here, or I could say save and add another insertion if I maybe needed to add two more than one assertion at this point. So I'm going to say save assertion. It's going to put us back into this recording state, right? So maybe the next thing I want to do is type in some reply text and go back to the main screen, right? So let's try that. Again, it's going to be slow. And at least with my testing, using it with emulator versus using it with a physical device was about the same speed. Um, the emulator, I think, if, if anything, the, the physical device was a little bit slower. So go back. 
Um, I'll put another assertion in here. Text is reply, save the assertion. So once we finally get to the point where we're done with our test, right? So I'm going to say I'm done with the test at this point. We want to hit the blue OK button, okay? So that's going to save our recorded test, okay? So it asks us what name we want to give that. Um, by default, it's just saying here's the name of the activity, add the word test, right? So I'm going to call this recorded test. So what it's done is it's taken all the actions that I did and then created a class, created a test class with that. Okay, so there's all my imports. There's my class. And there may be some issues with it. What's the first issue you see with this class? Yeah, yeah. See, it's still using the old test button, right? So there's the old J in it class. So I do have to, if I record it, I do actually have to go change that manually. All right, maybe the easiest way is to just remove that one and then bring it in here. Okay, so that's problem number one. Notice also that it's automatically marked it as a large test. It's just assumed that it is a large test. Um, so I may need to go in and go and change that. Okay. Now what's happening here? What's the code that we generated? So we start with those view interactions, right? So it's calling on view and saving it to a variable of some sort. And it's saying, well, it has to match all these criteria, right? So what what was that controlling interactive at first? Do you remember what it was? It was the edit text, right? So this should be the edit text. Okay, so it's saying it has to have this ID, and it has to be in this position in the hierarchy, and it has to be displayed. Logic? Not really. In fact, if I leave this as is, this will be more much more brittle, right? Because as soon as I move these controls around in the layout, right, this part breaks. See? So that's one of those things you have to kind of be wary of. If you're generating, either you're making a test or you're recording it, there may be quite a few changes that you have to go through and do. Right? In fact, I think when I recorded this previously, let me go ahead and try to run this. Because my test actually fails. I did a decent job of recording it, but it actually fails out of the box. Um, if I look at why it failed, let's go down here. You can see it says something about, hey, the view hierarchy didn't work, right? So it actually didn't find the set and button. It actually didn't find the send button. So if I look down here, let's see where did it where did it interact with the send button? So that should be here. Okay, so it says it couldn't find it. Well, so there's three filters to that. There's two different filters to that criteria. It's looking for it by ID, with text, child position, and this display. Right. So what I can see from that error is that child at position part actually failed. It might have been that way when it ran it, or that may be the, the code that it determined, but it actually determined that incorrectly. 
Um, so to even get this test to pass after I've recorded it, I need to remove that. So let's try to run that again. I suspect it's going to error somewhere else, which it did. And if I look at the error here, we can see, well, it's not displayed according to that. Is it looking on the wrong screen? Yeah. I'm going to, I think what's actually up is that the send button is probably hot, hidden by the keyboard. It may be part of it. Or maybe because the keyboard is in the process of closing. Um, so that's my guess. Um, so if I roll back here, let's make this the simplest possible that I can. I'm just going to say on view with the ID button main and try to run that. In theory, that should be enough to get me past that line. Yeah, it still didn't find it. So is there any other place where we were referring to button main? Looks like it. That's not. So it still failed. Um, so at least this is this is kind of the experience that I got to when I I, I tried to run it with recording. Um, so it can be kind of a helpful tool if maybe you don't know how to write some of the syntax, but um, it's not going to write your test for you. Suffice it to say. Um, it, you also notice that when it's naming these controls, it's kind of giving them random names. So at compat edit text, at comp three, two. Um, so more than likely, you're going to be better off just writing these from scratch. Does that make sense? So this tool does exist. You can play around with it. It may be helpful for learning the syntax, um, but you're going to be able to write I think that it's going to take more work to fix one of these tests um, than it would take to write it just in the first place, if that makes sense. At least that's, that's been my, that's my experience with the current tool. Um, one thing that's in one thing that I do need to mention because um, it wasn't mentioned on the slides here. Um, if you are working with things like spinners, um, there is an additional <laughs> method that you may need to use. Um, so if I think about a spinner, remember when I click on it, it's going to then open it. It's, yeah, before I can actually get to the options in the spinner, I have to actually click on it. So let's say I've got this drop down for what kind of telephone number you have. So maybe we have home, work, and other. If I want to actually get to one of these options, I first need to click on the spinner. So I might say on you do my with ID, etc. On view spinner dot perform click. Then I want to find the individual item that's here. Okay, so. A spinner, remember, is a subclass of adapter view. It takes an adapter to display options. Um, a list view is also an adapter view. Those are the two big ones. Um, any of those, if I'm looking for a specific option in either the spinner or the list view, the way I access that is not going to be with on view, but with on data. So if I say on data, Let's say I want to look for the work item. I would say on data work. 
that will then give me the option that has that text. Does that make sense? And then I would say perform play. So that's how you're going to work with, with spinners. And the, the code lab should walk you through that. Um, you also may find that I think the the homework is going to ask you to work with a recycler view. Um, notice that a recycler view is not an adapter view. Okay, So spinners and list views are adapter views, but a recycler view is not. Um, you may remember that we created an adapter for it which is actually kind of similar to the old adapter views, um, but it does behave in a different way because of how the recycler works. Um, so for that one in particular, um, if you read the concept chapter, it does talk a little bit about how to use it, but I think there's a, let me see if I can find the tutorial in here. Um, I'll actually just open up the code lab. Do they tell you, or was that in the coding challenge? Oh, yes, it was the coding challenge. Um, so in order to actually work with the recycler view, um, you'll see there's a link here about using the recycler view actions class. So kind of like there's the regular view actions class, there's a special recycler view actions that you'll want to use if you're working with the recycler. Um, and that will help you deal with some additional oddities with recycler, which means that, hey, first of all, I can't use on data because it's not an adapter view, but also it's a matter of, well, certain views are not displayed, right? If I want to go and select the last thing in a recycler view, that thing doesn't maybe exist yet at the time that I want to do it. So I need to potentially scroll down there um, and yada yada um, to actually be able to get to that last item in the list. Um, so Recycler view, app, view Actions will help you with actually being able to scroll down and, and get to those items. Does that make sense? So that's, that's one thing that you'll want to look into for the homework. Okay. Any questions? Um, I would say that it would be it's well worth it. Maybe it's going to be worth your time to, you know, obviously go through the code lamps, but also to potentially use this for your tests going forward. Whether or not there's um, points for it, this is going to make it a lot easier as your as your programs get bigger to test them, right? Rather than going through every workflow every time you change something you can write some of these tests and then just say run and make sure that everything's still okay. Um, so you might want to write some of these for your current hands-on test as well as your future hands-on tests. And I would definitely say that you're going to want to write some of these for your final project because it's going to be big enough to really need some more than likely. Okay.